the strangest tip experience I've had is when they were having us ask customers how much would you like to tip, and they would tell you and you'd have to type it into the machine. But I think both people in a really awkward position. You need to ask yourself why you're tipping. If you're sensitive enough to what people think of you, you might want to go ahead and tip. I'm Julie Rose, and this is Top of Mind. I have been a radio journalist for two decades, but a few years ago, I found myself avoiding the news for long stretches because of how depressing and divisive it all seems. I still wanted to be informed and engaged on important issues, though, and I figured I couldn't be alone in that. So we created this podcast. Each week, we tackle one tough topic in a way that will challenge you, help you feel more empathy, and empower you to become a better citizen, a kinder neighbor, and a more effective advocate. Today, why is everyone asking for a tip? I kind of feel awkward about it. Like, there's no reason to do a tip. This is Matt Johnson, a Top of Mind listener who reached out with a story of his tipping point. It it was last summer. He was at his favorite shaved ice shack in Houston, where he lives, ordering his usual. Nothing too crazy, just get a large shaved ice, you know, a little gummy worms thrown in and some whipped cream. But this time was different. The cashier took Matt's card, flipped the tablet to show options for leaving a tip, and looked Matt straight in the eye. Yeah, and he watched me do it. This is, they always look away. It's really weird. I don't know why he's looking. <laughs> I mean, like, is, are you just wanting to know what I'm going to do? Or are you trying to pressure me a little bit? And Matt's thinking, this guy didn't even make my shaved ice. He had someone else do it. And he was just taking orders, really, and relaying the information. Like, are you getting paid a sub minimum wages? Or or what's the reason why you're look, having me do a tip option? And so I felt very uncomfortable. And, and kind of more, it kind of pushed me more towards less prone to do the tipping, actually. Now, I have never had someone stare me down while I made my tip choice, but that moment is awkward regardless. The whole system of tipping in America seems to have reached a turning point. We are being asked for tips more than ever before. And according to a recent survey by Pew Research, we're all a little annoyed and a lot confused. What is the tip at the counter for? Who's getting that money? Is it okay to refuse? What are the rules? Well, that is what we're trying to figure out today on Top of Mind. But also what's going on beneath the surface that's driving workers to ask more and customers to feel so strongly about it. Because tipping is weirdly emotional. There's anger, frustration, shame, pity, pride. And it is not just about the money. It's about how we value people doing really personal things for us. People who are often strangers of a different social status. The confusion that we're feeling is pretty easy to explain. What most of us learned about tipping doesn't apply as clearly anymore. I took my cues watching grown-ups toss a few bills on the table after a meal out. Matt Johnson's education was way more formal. My parents sat us down as children, and we were teenagers uh, at the time. I'm the youngest of five. So, yeah, they sat us down. And he said it's expected to at least tip something, right? Because they're sub-minimum wage, they don't get much as it is. And so he said that at 10%, you're just saying that their service is bad. You still tip them, right? And then 15 to 18 is about average or good, and 20% plus is great. They did a really great job above and beyond their call of duty. Okay, but what if there is no server? There's just a cashier behind the counter. I really don't understand the reason for it. If they feel a need to make more money, why don't you just up the prices and, you know, not have to make people do that or just have a tip jar. A tip jar still makes sense to him. In fact, last time Matt was in a tipping situation, both scenarios came into play. It was a birthday party at a hibachi grill restaurant that added an automatic 20% gratuity to the bill for larger groups. But even then, when the hibachi grill chef came around and you saw his, you know, decked out, Um, stand with everything he had, there was a jar with cash in it Hmm. um, to make it very visible that it's expected. Did you put any cash in the jar? We we put a 10 in there. Yeah. We assumed that the 20% would go towards a general tipping pool of sorts and that that $10 would go directly to him for his performance. It was very personable 
um, did a great job cooking our food, made it very fun for us as an experience. So doing that little extra bit to him personally is kind of our thank you. But as tip requests get more common, Matt worries about the times when he can't afford to tip as much as the worker's expecting. I've actually had a recent interesting experience. Um, I'd normally get my own haircuts by my wife um, at home to save money. But instead, we're going to the salon first time in a long time. And they even did, you know, beard stuff as my first time growing a beard. And, you know, she's coached me through it and it was really helpful. And so I gave her a generous tip. Thank you very much. And, and I come back again and I give her a little bit smaller tip. Financially, things are getting more difficult. There came a point he wasn't able to tip much at all. And she started becoming less and less favorable towards me as, as her customer. And I, I was wondering if that was seen as my reflection to her performance or if, if she understood as I talked about it, our, financially, our financial situations have changed. How does that feel as a consumer for you then? I mean, even if going out for shave ice, you're kind of like, I feel bad. I can't, I'm not going to, you know. Yeah, it makes me want to go a little bit less, actually, because I don't want to have to be faced that moment and know that I can't. Thanks to Top of Mind listener Matt Johnson in Houston for chiming in. So this new tipping situation is not very comfortable for the person on the other side of the counter either, it turns out. Part of what's awkward, I think, from my side at least, is I I can't really go anywhere, right? So I have to stand there and look at you, even if I don't really want to. This is barista and baker Jamie Wilson. You know, I think there's this feeling of like being stared at, and I get that. But also, like, it's my job to stand there, right? So it's sort of, I don't really want to be doing it any more than, you know, you do. Wilson has worked for tips her entire career. It goes all the way back to my first job ever, age of 15, working at an ice cream store. And nearly all her positions have been behind the counter, in that gray area where she's not being paid sub-minimum wage as a server. But she's also relying on tips more than customers might think. Probably in the 30% range. That is how much of her income has come from tips at the most. The highest point was actually during the pandemic when she worked at a coffee shop and bakery in Brooklyn. That was actually the strangest tip experience I've had, which is when as a result of sort of safety concerns, they were having us ask customers, how much would you like to tip? So every interaction, you'd finish it and say, how much would you like to tip? And they would tell you and you'd have to type it into the machine, um, unless they were handing you cash. So it was sort of, it was the first time that it, for me at least, was sort of like something to think about. You know, up until then, it was like I knew that I was taking jobs that would have tips and that would be included and it would sort of make up a wage and that was, that was the deal. And this was the first time when it was like, we need to face this kind of head on. And it's, you know, puts, I think, both people in a really awkward position to say, you know, how much are you going to pay me? Were you annoyed that you had to ask it? I was annoyed, and I also recognized that it was increasing our tips. So, you know, I mean, there's, I think there was a direct correlation between confronting people with that and then feeling bad and leaving a tip, you know? Um, so, So I think it was this sort of, like, necessary awkwardness that we all were kind of, like, on board to... To maintain. Because it meant more money for you. Yeah. Did anyone ever say no tip? Oh, all the time. Yeah. I mean, that was part of the deal, right? Is it's, I think, um, you know, there are people who don't tip. And they did that whether you asked them or not. You know, this was just, again, sort of the first time when it was like, you have to say it to my face. (laughs) Mm. Um, Which I think really changes things. In what way? Well, you know, historically with tips, it's the thing that you sort of write on the bill and then you leave the restaurant, right? Or you finish paying for your coffee, you type it in and you go get it and you leave. But it's not something that you have to really confront. You know, it's this thing that we've accepted as how we pay people in service jobs. And it has this seediness to it. It has this sort of, you know, everyone knows that it's kind of awkward and kind of not sustainable and not really kind, you know, has all these things mixed into it that we just don't really like to admit or talk about. It's a lot easier to just, you know, leave a, leave a dollar and walk away. You, you would prefer to not work for tips? Yeah, I would prefer to just make a living wage. 
you know, I mean, to just be paid at a, a decent rate and have, you know, I mean, I think the the issue that places run into is in order to pay employees what they should be paid, um, you have to have a cost of goods that people don't necessarily want to pay because they're used to paying a lot less and then adding a tip. And for some reason that feels better, right? It's like, if you're buying a $4 coffee and you're leaving a $1 tip, why not just pay $5 and then not have to leave a tip, right? But there's some mental jump that I think is hard for people to make because we're so used to this other way of doing it, which is also inherently degrading. Jamie Wilson's concerns are shared by social justice activists working to eliminate tipping. And they often point to the sordid history of the practice. Tipping likely originated in medieval England, with feudal lords in the habit of handing an extra coin to a beggar on the roadside, or a servant who performed well. There's evidence of a similar practice among American slaveholders, including Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, tipping people they enslaved. After the Civil War, tipping gained popularity as a way to justify keeping wages low for formerly enslaved people working in service jobs like restaurants, hotels, and passenger trains. By the early 1900s, tipping was falling out of favor in Europe, but had become standard practice in the American hospitality sector. And then in 1938, Congress made it official with a provision in the Fair Labor Standards Act, which established a federal minimum wage, but made an exception for restaurant workers who collect tips. And we just have kept doing it. At the end of the day, I'm doing a job that I should be just simply paid to do. And the tip should sort of maybe be extra, you know, that is not relied upon. Um, But what you're doing in a tip system is you're giving the customer the right to decide how much labor is worth. And I also think that, to be totally fair, that's an issue with the business, with an owner who's not paying people enough money. And also an issue with customers who will not shop there if they raise their prices. So, I mean, it's part of a kind of American consumer economy problem. Oh, it's a huge... I mean, yeah, this is, again, this is all of it goes so deep, I think. You know, it's it becomes almost not even about the tip itself, right? It's part of it at the end of the day is people don't like changing their mentality. And they also don't, I mean, this is a thing that I think came out pretty strongly in the pandemic is people don't totally love being questioned on things that they have accepted for so long, right? It's like, if this is how it works and this is how we do things and like, why are we digging into it? And now we're going to find these problems. And it's like, yeah, they've always existed, (laughs) right? So I think what's happening now is, is people are saying, well, let's go back to to sort of not worrying about tips and, you know, but it's like what what was revealed is that we need to sort of pay more attention to who's in charge of businesses, right? And pay attention to where you're shopping and how it's working. You're glad then for this having been forced into the front of our minds, like the, the, okay. the discomfort of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, there's a lot of learning that happens from discomfort. And I would say selfishly, it's nice that it's also coming from the other side. So I'm, I'm personally very grateful that, uh, that people are, are thinking about it. And I think it might be good for us to just talk about it more. There's never anything wrong with just saying, hey, how does this work? Because that's, you know, it works differently everywhere, right? There are servers who are making $2.50 an hour. And if you don't tip them, they make no money. And there are coffee shops where the tips are only going to the baristas. It varies place to place, restaurant to restaurant. And it's, you know, a lot of the awkwardness also is just a very strong division between customer and server that I think we don't need to have. You know, at the end of the day, we're two people. You need a service and I'm here to provide it. And that doesn't need to be a shady thing. It doesn't need to be a loaded experience. It's just a transaction. There's been historically a lot of sort of emotional and cultural and political implications of who is serving what to who and how much does it cost and all of this. And it's like, you know, and and that's tied in too with how customers feel they get to treat people, right? I mean, the whole thing of the customer's always right and must be pampered and taken care of. I think that's kind of going out the window, now. <laughs> you know, where it's like, actually, you're just buying a coffee and I'm happy to make it for you. Just don't be a jerk. 
Jamie Wilson is a former barista, line cook, server, manager, and currently a self-employed baker based in Brooklyn. Incidentally, she does not request tips on the baked goods she sells. And if her business were to grow large enough to have employees, she would not allow tipping. Going gratuity-free was a big trend among restaurants about 10 years ago. A few famous examples still exist, but it turns out that it is really hard to go against tipping culture in America. Mike Fadum tried it with his wood-fired pizzeria. I was really, like, bold and really just thought I could do everything better than everyone I'd worked for, which is just totally not true. His specialty is an onion pizza, by the way. Which is just like a sea of onions on top of the pizza. Are they, like, caramelized onions? No, they're raw. They're raw, but it's this flavor profile that's kind of Sicilian. It's like oregano, a little lemon, and onions, and... We put provolone cheese on, which is really nice with onions. But it, it works. I don't know how. Yeah, it just works. <laughs> yeah. And people really want to tip him for it. I'm Julie Rose. This is Shop of Mind. Grab some breath mints. We'll be right back. Before we get back to today's episode, I want to take just a moment to recommend another show from the BYU Radio family of podcasts, The Lisa Show. Life can be stressful, but Lisa Valentine Clark, her guests, and Council of Moms provide a practical yet positive and empowering look at life's challenges. They tackle them head on, sharing experiences, offering suggestions on how we can handle things like relationships and health, technology, body image, family, and much more. It's The Lisa Show. Listen wherever you get podcasts. Mike Fadum is an indie rocker at heart. In the mid-2000s, he was the drummer for this band, The Jealous Girlfriends. He was working restaurant jobs around New York to make ends meet. And so I, I just realized I wasn't really about to make it anytime soon after doing it for so long. So I was like, I really love doing the service work that I did. And so I just kind of like flipped the focus to be that and do music on the side for fun. He worked his way up to management positions and in 2015 helped a popular restaurant called Romans do away with tips. And that was a really cool experience. It was really kind of new and like bold of the owner. And it inspired Fadum to go tip free from the start when he made the leap to opening his own restaurant called Ops the next year. I have a partner as well and she's French. So she comes from like a no tipping culture. And so we both kind of, I had just, I had just done the switch over and was really on board with the idea of it. And we'd, I'd done so much research and we'd been doing so much work that it like felt cool and like the thing to do at the time was to like keep going with that. They were part of a trend among mid and upscale restaurants in New York, San Francisco and L.A., motivated by long-standing frustration that restaurant owners and their kitchen staff have about tipping. You know, like restaurants, it's like the only business in the world that like the restaurant doesn't pay its workers. When you talk to a server, and I, I was a server, this is just how it is, they're like, you don't pay me, the customer pays me. It's a weird gray area where they get that I'm the boss, but like it's like a psychological thing of like the money is not coming from the restaurant. Even more troubling, says Fatum, is how tipping tends to result in servers getting paid a lot more than everyone else, including the cooks making the food. Yeah, I mean, we definitely really dislike that there's such a huge pay disparity between the kitchen workers and the and the service workers. They get paid half as much per hour as the servers get paid when you account for the tips. Now, the federal government and many states allow what's called a tip credit for restaurants, which means servers can be paid less than the minimum wage if they make enough tips to cover the difference. The disparity between the so-called front-of-house and back-of-house workers depends a lot on the city and the type of restaurant. But in New York, where Fadum was setting up his pizza shop, it's common for tip servers to make around $30 an hour, while cooks and hostesses get a flat wage closer to 15 and the more expensive the restaurant, the larger the disparity. When restaurants eliminate tips, they typically either raise their prices to make up the difference or add a service fee to the bill. Both tend to tick off customers, so Fatum did neither. 
again, like I, I really thought I knew more than everybody else. So we, we didn't really make the prices higher. It's especially hard with a pizza place. It's like, how do you make farm to table pizza and not sell like a $30 pizza to people like a 12 inch Neapolitan pizza. It's like every pizza place is like the same price, 18 bucks or whatever it is. We just were really afraid to like raise the prices to the correct price and have like the neighborhood people and the regulars still come. Now, Fadum's kitchen staff were happy with higher than average wages, but he couldn't pay his servers competitively without the tips. We just couldn't keep servers People really wanted to work there and were really into it and loved the idea of it, but they couldn't make enough money. So it just like, they were like, oh, I'll work two or three days at this other place and like that'll cover me and then I'll work like one or two days at Ops and it's like really fun and I like it. By 2019, the writing was on the wall. We just like financially like weren't, it wasn't working. And like people want to tip. Why are we fighting this? Like, uh... It's just, it's, this is already hard enough doing or making a restaurant, running a restaurant. So when we switched, we actually were able to like immediately, just everybody got paid more, basically, because of tipping. Um, you were able to pay your cooks, your back of house more because you could pay your front of house, your servers less because customers would compensate. Exactly. Like right now, like we pay our our cooks, you know, I don't know anyone that pays cooks as well as we do, or, or definitely not better. The cooks get paid um, like 25 an hour. Yeah. Or the majority of them. There's a couple of new people that are working their way up. But mm. yeah. And then are you paying it's just the tip credit to amount to your servers? Yeah, it's it's ten sixty five now in New York. But they're still making, by the, at the end of a shift, they could be counted on to be bringing home 40 something plus 40, 50 bucks an hour. 50 to 50. Yeah, it's like 48 to 55 an hour uh -huh. with their tips. Ops was by no means unusual in caving to the tip system. Most of the restaurants and big name owners who made a splash going gratuity free in the mid 2010s backtracked after a few years. Once Fatum switched, things got so good, he was able to open a second restaurant called Leo. Well, you know, we opened right before the pandemic, Leo. So, we were doing really well before the pandemic, and now we're not doing amazingly well, but just the cost of everything. And I really like retaining the staff. So a lot of my staff has been with us for like three, four years. And when you do that, you have to keep paying people more, um, which is great, but it's just like that adds to the cost. Did, did people's tipping behavior change during the pandemic? People were definitely tipping better during the pandemic, for sure. Um, just really, you know, recognizing that we were all like, you know, working, didn't need to work necessarily, but we were. Everything was takeout or delivery during that period, of course. And post-pandemic, the tips are lower, but Fatum says it's still really common for people to add a few bucks to their takeout bill. For picking up, people tip less for sure, but there's like, you know, maybe like 10% or something. Definitely. Why? What are people tipping when they're tipping for takeout? You're not actually coming to their de table and serving them. Yeah, I mean, the, so, I don't know, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. They're tipping for whatever, the service of give, give, being given the food. Um, for delivery, the tip all goes to the to the delivery person. So they're, the people that get delivery tip pretty well. And where does the tip go at the counter? Does that whole tip go to whoever pushed, whoever was standing in front of me when I pushed the button or... Yeah, exactly, yeah. His newer restaurant, Leo, also has a casual coffee shop side where people get pizza by the slice. And there, Fatum's workers are now using tablets with the screen that suggests a tip with every purchase. And he says it doesn't seem to bother people. Yeah, I don't think so. And like also, it's so common now. I don't know. It, I think maybe a year ago, I would have had a different answer, but I don't know. What do you think about that? I mean, do you always feel like, oh, yes, I should be, you know, everywhere we go, like now, it doesn't matter if it's like fast food or fast <laughs> fast casual or if it's in some places like specialty grocers, like self-checkout yeah. and you're asked to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's, that's a tough one. But I just think about how little people are paid for these jobs. And so I, I always tip just because I, being a boss of these people, I just think about that all the time. Do you worry about the possibility that people are going to get so 
annoyed with being asked to tip everywhere, that they might stop tipping the people who really need it most. Yeah. Like your servers who are literally getting 1075 an hour or whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, it doesn't seem like it's going to change at restaurants. Uh, the main thing is I wonder if like people are just going to keep getting pushed to like just order online. If you go to like the, the deli and like get some toilet paper and then you're asked to tip, why wouldn't you just order from Amazon? You know, um, I feel like m younger modern people are just going to be fed up with, and, all, and we're just more and more, we're just like not having any interactions with anyone. Would you like to see tips go away? Sort of like if you didn't have to do it on your own? Would you like to see it go away? Just everybody have higher prices, no more tips. I would like that. I would, there's a, there's kind of a movement here to like do away with the tip credit and allow tips to be shared, which I think is maybe a more realistic move. Most owners of restaurants are worried about this because they think that the servers costing more will like destroy their economics. But I do think you can like just offset that money and have higher retention of, of staff in the kitchen. Um, so you'd like to see, you'd like to see where tips could be shared, um, pooled and yeah. shared across the house and, and then, and then basically have to pay the state minimum wage, whatever that is to your service. Yes. Okay. I think being able to put like a small percentage of the tips to the kitchen and like the servers would kind of be paid the same without changing prices. I think that would be amazing and it would, it would change the, cook a cook's life so much and would have a very little effect on the servers and maybe the cost of the restaurant would go up a little bit because of like the pay changing but I think it would benefit everyone in the long run. Mike Fadum is the owner of two pizza restaurants in Brooklyn called Ops and Leo. Up until just a few years ago, the tipping system that Fadum described as his ideal scenario wasn't actually legal, according to federal labor law. The longstanding rule was that tips could only be shared among other tipped workers, so bartenders, for example. Cooks and dishwashers were not allowed to be part of the tip pool. But Congress changed that in 2018, and the new rule kicked in as of 2021, allowing restaurants that pay their servers at least the federal minimum wage, so not the lower tip credit amount, to pool tips with workers out front and back in the kitchen, too. The catch is not all state wage and labor laws allow restaurants to take advantage of that rule. But it's at least possible now that the person taking your pizza order at the counter and the cook making it will both get part of the tip you opt for when that screen comes up. The only way to know, though, is to ask. What we still don't know is whether it's expected to tip in that moment, right? And does refusing make me a jerk? Well, if so, turns out I'm in good company. Lots of people are asking for tips, but surveys tell us that most consumers are resisting those requests and not tipping in these new contexts. So why are we being asked so much? I'm Julie Rose. This is Top of Mind. We'll be right back to today's episode of Top of Mind. But first, are you ready to immerse yourself in the awe-inspiring world of nature? Then I recommend you listen to Constant Wonder. It's another great show from the BYU Radio family of podcasts. Join host Marcus Smith in riveting conversations with individuals whose lives have been touched by Earth's beauty and mysteries. Uncover captivating stories that shed light on our planet's wonders, from history to science and beyond. If you crave enriching experiences and a deeper connection with the world around you, tune in to Constant Wonder. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. My name is Mike Lynn. I'm a professor at the Cornell Hotel School, and I've been studying tipping for 40 years. I mean, sometimes people call you the nation's tipping expert. Is that true, do you think? It's true to say that I've published more on the topic than anybody else by a long shot. 
Why did you get interested in tipping? I helped pay my way through school waiting tables and bartending. And then when I went to grad school, technically I wasn't supposed to work because I had a research assistantship. But I, the first month, I, I had to work for a month before I got my paycheck. And how was I to live? I needed to be a bartender. My advisor said that he would let me keep the bartending job on condition I came up with some kind of research to do in that setting. And that's what got me interested in it as a research topic, right? (laughs) Was it a good experience working for tips for you? Absolutely, yeah. The nice thing about tipping is it pays more uh, than any other job that requires comparable qualifications. I mean, it's a relatively low skill job, right? And yet you can get pretty good wages from it. When I was waiting tables, I started out, actually I started as a busboy and and then got moved up. It was a very fancy restaurant. We wore tuxedos, did tableside cooking, etc. But I made more than my manager. So yeah, why would I want to, if they had put me on wages, I'd have taken a pay cut. Lynn says right now we're dealing with twin tipping phenomena. There's tip creep. We're being asked to tip for services that we, and in service settings that we didn't use to tip. And tipflation. We're being asked to tip larger and larger amounts. Lynn says he hasn't studied specifically why businesses are asking for tips more right now. His scientific research is mostly focused on consumer tipping behavior. But he's got a pretty good idea. I think it's a combination of three things. First, during COVID, consumers started tipping more. They left larger tip amounts on those service occasions where there was an opportunity, and they started tipping for services they didn't traditionally. More people tipped for restaurant carryout. People started tipping for quick service. The press was telling people, all of these businesses are hurting. Your servers and the service workers are hurting. Help them out. And I think that there was social pressure to tip more during COVID. And consumers' willingness to tip larger amounts and in new service settings was noted by businesses, right? And kind of gave permission for them to ask. Secondly, there's post-COVID, the economic environment increases the motivation of businesses to ask because we have full employment now. Restaurants are having a hard time finding employees. And it's not just restaurants, retail establishments are having a hard time finding employees. How do you typically compete for employees is through pay. But at the same time, we have inflation. And if I pay my workers more, I have to raise prices more. And during inflationary times, that's problematic. And so I can understand a business saying, I need to offer my employees more to retain them but I don't want to raise prices on all of my consumers. Let's have tipping as an option. Those consumers who can't afford to or don't want to don't have to tip. And so I think just the economic circumstances that businesses find themselves pressured them. And then the third thing is that the new technologies have made it more effective. He's talking about point of sale technology companies. Square, Toast, and Clover are the big ones that really went mainstream in the last few years. They all have tip screens built into their software with those recommendation buttons that we're all familiar with. And that tip screen is often a default setting when businesses install the software. In the past, if I had counter help, maybe my employees would say, can we put out a tip jar and I go fine? But after a while, they learned they weren't making that much. It wasn't worthwhile, and it was easy for me to remove the tip jar, right? And I'm not motivated to try it again. It just doesn't work. But the new technology puts more pressure on people, so it's more effective than it ever has been. And I think it's the combination of those three things is why we're seeing what we're seeing. Yes. So so have they just digitized the tip jar or, or is this new tip screen actually doing something even different than the tip jar did? I think it's doing two things different from the tip jar. One, it's turning what used to be a sin of omission into a sin of commission. In the past, if I didn't want to tip, I just left without tipping. I omitted the tip. The new tip screens require me to actively hit a no tip button. It's a more active sin of commission. 
And many of us feel that sins of commission are more blameworthy and guilt-inducing than sins of omission. So that's certainly one thing that's different between tip jars and digital screens. I think even more importantly is the digital screens are hiding a lot of information that tip jars make public. First off, it's easier to see when someone is putting money in a tip jar than to see exactly what button they hit on the screen. Secondly, when they put money in a tip jar, it leaves a physical trace and evidence of what they've done, and not only them, but all the other customers who had come by previously. In the past, when CounterHelp would put out a tip jar, you could see that very few people left tips. Some people did. They were never empty, but they also weren't full. And that communicated to you, yeah, you can tip if you want, but most people aren't. It's not normative. You don't have to. The digital screens hide that information. And I think that most consumers are assuming they wouldn't be asking if it wasn't normative to tip in this setting. But that assumption is wrong, mm. okay? And how do I know it's wrong? First, nobody has the authority to create a tipping norm. They come from the behavior of consumers. Lots of people are asking for tips, but surveys tell us that most consumers are resisting and not tipping in these new contexts. They're clicking no. They're actually willing to commit the sin of commission. Most people are. Either that or they're paying cash to avoid the situation altogether. What I know is two-thirds of consumers say they don't tip for restaurant carryout. Very few people tip for uh, fast food or convenience store help. Do you expect that at some point companies will be like, ah, nobody's tipping, let's take that away? Or we're kind of stuck with this? Well, it's not that no one's tipping. I do believe these digital tipping screens are getting people who wouldn't otherwise tip to tip. So okay? it's a net win. <laughs> they are effective. Okay. But how many people are tipping? If it's 20% of consumers, that's enough to make it worthwhile doing, but it's not so much that I feel it's a norm and I should feel obligated to do it. And unless or until tipping in these new contexts becomes a social norm, we won't have any clear rules for it, which is a big driver of the awkwardness that we've all felt. We're in this nomad land between them. Because here's the thing. I did not know that it wasn't that most people were not tipping. I assumed most people were. So I've been doing it <laughs> because I felt obligated. <laughs> and now that I know that it's not yet the norm, I honestly feel like I might feel a little more empowered to say no next time right. I'm faced with that. And so you need to ask yourself why you're tipping. Right. If it's for disapproval. Right. If it's to avoid disapproval or to get social approval, you're at the counter and you're facing this tip screen. Whether it's a norm or not, you know that employee wants a tip. If they're asking for a tip, they want the money. And if you don't give it, they're going to be disappointed and they're going to think less well of you than if you do give it. OK, if you're sensitive enough to what people think of you, you might want to go ahead and tip. But if you're not super sensitive and you're aware that two out of three customers don't tip in that setting, and in some of the retail settings, it's even less, one out of five customers tips, then you know any disapproval is going to be shared. I'm not the only one they're going to be upset at. They're not going to be super upset at me because they can't be super upset at everyone. Mm -hmm. And that diminishes that fear of disapproval. Yeah. The okay. calculation, I, I imagine the calculation changes, though, if this is a place that I frequent regularly and a face that I see often. Yes. And it adds another one because then it becomes an issue of future service. And I want to get good service in the future. And if I'm a frequent patron, they're likely to be aware of my tipping habits. Yeah. And have my order ready faster or see me coming or and just be a little bit warmer in their greeting of me. Yeah. So are there any downsides to being asked to tip like kind of big picture? Obviously, the benefits are clear for the employees and for the companies. People pay, therefore it's worth asking. Um, are there any risks? Well, sure. 
consumers don't like it. Consumers are feeling pressure, unwanted social pressure to live tips in settings that they're not accustomed to and don't want to leave. That's in itself a downside, right? And where does it stop? Do I then have to tip at the grocery store, at the clothing retailer? Not everybody can afford it. And I don't think that it's fair for people to feel uncomfortable or bad about themselves or embarrassed or to be discriminated against because they can't afford to tip. So tip creep and tipflation may expose customers to discrimination. But Mike Lynn says there's ample evidence of discrimination and inequity at play in the way tipping already works. Research that I've done shows that attractive waitresses get better tips than less attractive waitresses. White servers get better tips than black servers, right? And people argue that that discrimination is just not fair. We shouldn't have a system that allows that. One of the implications of that is that it may be unlawful under current civil rights law. The Supreme Court ruled at one point that the Civil Rights Act prohibits apparently neutral business practices that have an adverse impact on protected classes. Even if you don't intend to discriminate, if your business practices do in fact discriminate against certain groups of employees, it's unlawful under the Civil Rights Act. Arguably, tipping is one of those apparently neutral business practices that has an adverse impact because people of color get lower tips than white people. I think that that's a class action lawsuit that's just waiting to happen. There are people who argue servers are making less than the standard minimum wage. When we look at some of the data, servers are disproportionately likely uh, to be living in poverty, to be on public assistance, et cetera. And they attribute that to the tipping system and to the substandard wages. Technically, you're only allowed to pay a substandard wage if it's made up for in tips. And part of the problem is that many tipped workers are part-time, not full-time, right? And the people who take tipped work are, tend to be low skill younger women, groups of people who traditionally, even if it's non-tipped work, tend to get paid less. So that plenty of people make the argument that tipping impoverishes servers, whereas I've told you I think it pays them too much. Yeah. Why were servers making twice the money of cooks, twice the money of hostesses? It's not a higher skill set job. Arguably, cooking is a higher skill set job. You could say, well, to be a server, because it's a customer facing position, it requires appearance, it requires language and social skills that we place an economic premium on. And that's why they get more than cooks. But being a hostess requires those same social skills. The fact is there is no good argument. They're getting that money because consumers are willing to give it to them to buy their social approval. I think there are circumstances where servers are not paid adequately, but the vast majority of the cases it overpays servers. Um, so those are some of the arguments for why people are trying to eliminate tipping. The unfortunate thing is that when restaurants have done that, their online ratings go down because I've done the research to test it. The only exception is really upscale restaurants that replace tipping with higher menu prices. They seem to be able to get away with it. Their online ratings are unchanged. So the rub is this. 70% of us are confused and annoyed by tipping right now, but we're stuck with it because we consumers insist on it. If I eliminate tipping, I have to replace it with either higher menu prices or service charges. Consumers in this country hate service charges. It's a mandatory tip, and we don't want to be told that we have to do something that used to be voluntary, okay? So that when I look at all types of restaurants, upscale, downscale, you know, midscale, if they've replaced tipping with service charges, their online ratings go down. Why? Because we hate being told that we have to tip. If they replace tipping with higher menu prices, Mid and lower scale restaurants, online ratings go down. Why? Because their menu prices are higher. They're perceived as too expensive. 
you might expect many of the restaurants that tried this did expect, yes, my menu prices are higher, but you don't have to tip. It's a wash. Unfortunately, consumers are not rational, <laughs> okay? And they evaluate restaurant expensiveness by looking at menu prices. I've done the research to show that that's what they focus on and that they think a restaurant with 15% higher menu prices and no tipping, they think it's more expensive than a restaurant that has tipping. Even if those people say they tip 20%, okay? Um, and so the only people who get around that are really upscale restaurants catering to a price insensitive clientele. They don't mind so much. It seems like a real catch um, for employers um, if they'd like to, and anyone who's like advocating that tips be done away with because, you know, to, to address the discrimination questions, right? I mean, are you aware of anyone out there who is successfully um, navigating this in a way that hasn't harmed their business, <laughs> right? European companies do right. it, right? I mean, in, in, in other countries, yes. tipping isn't the norm. Uh, like it is here in the States. Right. But in European countries, they don't have a tip credit. So they have to pay their employees a lot anyway. And that decreases the incentive to allow tipping. And um, the social norm there is that things could cost a little more because you know you're not tipping. So, yeah. And yeah, and all your competitors are charging more, right? Yeah. Um, is there a solution? If I could set the system, I would eliminate the tip credit. Meaning that everybody has to be paid a minimum wage, that, that employers, employers can't pay servers less because of tips. And then I would encourage states to adopt the federal standard, the current federal standard. This is relatively new. Let's pay everybody a standard wage. Let's keep tipping. But those tips then get shared and pooled. And that pool and distribution can be free of the kinds of inequities we've talked about. There are a number of states, California, Washington, Oregon, um, I think Minnesota, I don't remember all of them, uh, that have eliminated the tip credit. They're in their restaurant and service industry seem to be doing fine. Add to that list Alaska, Montana, and Nevada. And it's interesting to note the best solution he can envision to Tipping's inherent problems is the same one pizzeria owner Mike Fadum would prefer. At the end of the day, they're both saying, look, Americans won't let tipping die, so let's at least make it more fair. And what does that say about us as a society? I asked Mike Lynn. I have two answers to that. And by the way, this is just theory. There's a anthropologist at the University of Berkeley named George Foster, who developed the theory that tipping evolved as a way of forestalling envy, that we tip especially in eating and drinking establishments because the customers there are having a great time and the employees are obviously working. And it is natural for us to envy other people who are better off than us. Customers concerned about the envy of these workers would say, hey, don't envy me. Here's a tip, here's money, you can have a drink on me afterwards. And his evidence for this is that the word for tip in many languages around the world translates to drink money. Hmm. And and why would I care about the envy of a, of a server? Because I, I wouldn't want them to spit in my drink well, <laughs> or you, something. <laughs> perhaps you don't want them to spit in your drink, but also we, we're social creatures, we want people to like us and think well of us and not think badly. So you asked, what does it say about us? I think it says that we're social animals and we care about the approval of others. And to some extent, we fear their disapproval. Related to that, we if you notice, we tend to tip low status occupations. We don't tip lawyers, we don't tip doctors, we don't tip professors. We tend to tip relatively low status people in part because it's in some way, it gives consumer power, right? Americans at first didn't like tipping because it was kind of aristocratic and not egalitarian. And 
for one person to give another person money at their own discretion made that other person a beggar, right? And, and somehow diminished them. And arguably, tipping does that. Um, and so it says that we are willing to tolerate status and power differences. Some people are willing to debase themselves for money and other people are willing to give out money in order to elevate themselves relative to those. Both of these are potential implications of tipping and what it says about human nature. Yeah, that's really interesting. If I want to be, I want to be a good person in an egalitarian society and sort of do my part to kind of encourage respect and um, care for and appreciation, how would I, how should I be thinking about tipping? When to tip and when not to tip? I don't like telling people what they should do. Let me tell you what I do, okay? And then if people find that instructive, so be it. <laughs> um, I ask myself, why am I tipping? And if there's a good reason, I tip. If I know servers are getting a substandard wage and I think that they need the money to just to make a reasonable living and recompense for the work they're doing, I tip. If people do an extraordinarily good job, I had a locksmith who removed a key that I had broken off in my car. He was self-employed. He set his own wages and he charged a lot per hour, but I had him out there for two hours in freezing weather. And I thought, you know what? He deserves even more than he asked for. And I gave him a tip on top of it. If I want good service in the future, when I get delivery, those are people I see frequently. I want them to be happy to take my order and to bring it to me. Those are all reasons and motivations that I have for tip. And when I want a tip, I do. But if my primary motivation is fear of disapproval, I refuse to tip. Mike Lynn is a professor of consumer behavior at Cornell University's School of Hotel Administration, and he studies tipping. I'd love to hear if anything in this episode has you thinking about tips differently. I actually had a small stick with it moment hearing Jamie Wilson, the barista and baker, talk about relying on tips to cover her basic expenses. I came into this episode, I'm gonna admit, really wanting some justification to not tip at the counter. It has been so annoying for me. And learning that a business might be keeping prices and wages a little lower to attract my business and then counting on tips to make up the difference for workers, that was an uncomfortable insight I did not really wanna hear. It's got me rethinking how I handle that moment for sure. Have you encountered a challenging perspective in life or just listening to a Top of Mind episode that has prompted a stick with it moment for you? Send an email to topofmind at byu.edu. I personally respond to every email. They really mean a lot to the team. Top of Mind is a BYU radio podcast. Today's episode was produced by Elena Beck and me with help from Samuel Benson, James Hoops, and Sam Payne. Our audio engineer and sound design team includes Brandon Lewis, Kelsey Ney, Carly Wilson, and Trent Reimschussel. I'm Julie Rose. We'll talk soon.